Awesome. All right. So yeah, like I was saying, we had some technical issues uh, last week, so cut, got cut off a little bit mid-sentence. Uh, but where essentially we left off was on page 99. And uh, what we were talking about was the importance of demonstrating these principles in all our fairs. And the section that we're in with working with others is how to manage and, and navigate romantic relationships and how to rekindle those, you know, difficult, not difficult, it was difficult because I made it difficult, but rekindle those relationships that we destroyed and how to rebuild. And the biggest part about that is I need to demonstrate and demonstrate these spiritual, uh, these spiritual actions. So the paragraph that I really, I was on a tangent at the end of the paragraph. So where we will pick up is on uh, page, again, page 99, if there be divorce or separation. So it'll be the second full paragraph. All right. So it says, if there be divorce or separation, there should be no undue haste for the couple to get together. Now, I don't know about you, and I'm sure maybe you all have had very healthy romantic relationships, and no one in this room can relate to getting into a relationship and then out of it, and then back into it, and then back out of it, and then back into it. I'm just saying that's something that I might have had ex some experience with. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I had a lot of haste. I had a lot of, no, I'd like to get back together right now. Let's fix it. Let's do it. But it's saying, hold on, hold on, slow your brakes before we dive right back into a relationship. Welcome. We're on page 99, the paragraph, if there be divorce or separation. So it says the man should be sure of his recovery. So essentially what it's saying is the alcoholic needs to be sure of his recovery. How do I know that I am sure of my recovery or not? Am I in a recovered state? Are the step 10 promises real in my life? Do I have this daily program of action? And am I working with others? Oh man, that sounds like I'm gonna have to do a whole lot of work before I can get into that relationship thing. And a lot of spiritual action. Welcome, those who just joined, we're on page 99 and paragraph, if there be divorce or separation. So it says the wife, and what we're talking about wife is just the non-alcoholic, should, should fully understand his new way of life. And one of the things I always emphasize is that this is a way of life. This isn't to set it and forget it. It's not do a set of steps, I'm done. It's not a 30-day, 60-day, 90-day treatment program. This is how I live my life. Now, the non-alcoholics are not addicts in my life. How are they going to understand my new way of life? Well, it's my responsibility. Again, of course, I can explain verbally, but far more than that to demonstrate with my action. If the old relationship is to be resumed, it must be on a better basis since the former did not work. I would always try to restart that old relationship on the same basis. And when we talk about basis, when we see that word basis, we're talking about foundation for life. And it says this means a new attitude and spirit all around. And it's a little bit of a sneaky definition of a spiritual awakening. For those who have been coming to the study regularly, you'll know that quite often I try to avoid going to the spiritual appendix and find all the sneaky definitions for spiritual awakening. They think it's fun and because there's so many. So a new attitude and spirit, another definition. So sometimes it is the best interest of all concerned that the couple remain apart. Obviously, no rule can be laid down. Let the alcoholic continue his program day by day. So I need to have this program and I need to be working the daily program of action. I need to be active in my 10, in my 11, and again, working with others. And it says, when the time for living together has come, it will be apparent to both parties. It will be obvious. And oftentimes when I'm working with spot C's and I'm like, listen, it's not apparent. It's not, like, I'll tell you that it's not. I needed people to tell me it wasn't apparent. I mean, I didn't listen to them, but I needed to be told, right? And I just, I love this because we're getting back into that theme that we saw on page 98. 
that my sobriety and my emotional sobriety is not contingent upon anything outside myself. On page 99, it says, let no alcoholic say he cannot recover unless he has his family back. This just isn't so. In some cases, the wife will never come back for one reason or another. Remind the prospect that his recovery is not dependent upon people. It is dependent upon his relationship with God. That is such an important line. My sobriety, welcome, we're just on page 100. Uh, my sobriety cannot ever be contingent upon anything outside of myself. And that's, I mean, that's good news and that's bad news. I really talk about that a lot, the good news and the bad news. The good news is that because my sobriety is not contingent upon anything outside of myself, I mean, that's good because so much of the things outside of myself are outside of my control. I can't control it. But my sobriety is contingent upon my relationship with God. And that is something that is in my control. And there are storms in life and there is pain in life and there are things that happen and we can weather those storms and we can get through it. Contingent on my relationship with the God of my understanding. I was sharing about this last week and, and that just that has been my experience. Some of, the, some of the most difficult times in my life have happened in my sobriety. And I would never have been able to get through any of that, sober or even, even anywhere near spiritually well, if it had not been for these spiritual actions that get me connected with God. It says on the top of page 100, we have seen men get well whose families have not returned at all. And we have seen others slip when the family has come back too soon. And I love this next paragraph. Because it has got, and I, to be fair, I will say this about like almost every paragraph. I love this paragraph. But it has got one of my absolute fam favorite promises in the book. Just, I love it. And uh, so it says, both you and the new man must walk day by day in the path of spiritual progress. And again, that this, I mean, I know we're kind of sick of me hearing it. It is a daily program of action. I can't set it and forget it. I've got to continue to work it but also that this is a path of spiritual progress. Often in the rooms, we'll hear it's progress, not perfection. And, and that is the one area where I admit I am pedantic. I am annoying. As I want to point out, it's not progress, not perfection. It's spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. How often do I confuse the gifts of recovery, of sobriety with sobriety itself? I got the job back. My health's coming back. The partner, the spouse is coming back. I've got money in the bank. I'm progressing. And all of us here know that that will do nothing to keep me sober. How am I progressing spiritually? That's what matters. How is my relationship with God growing and developing? That's what matters. And isn't it great that I don't have to muddle around in the dark to figure out how I can grow spiritually? I'm given the clear-cut directions of these steps to get there. It says, if you persist, remarkable things will happen. And I just love that it is me and the new man, and we are walking together on this path. And us walking together on this path of spiritual progress, remarkable things happen. I'm not on this moral hilltop. I, I tell my sponsees, don't put me on a podium. They're not wheelchair accessible. I can't get down. Uh, but, but we are equal in this thing. I'm no better than you. I'm no worse than you. But I might have a little bit more experience applying these spiritual principles. Let me show you how they worked with me. And so we're working together shoulder to shoulder. And this is the promise. When we look back, we realize the things which came to us when we put ourselves in God's hands were better than anything we could have planned. Follow the dictates. Now, we don't like dictates, so follow the spiritual principles, right? Like follow the directions of a higher power, capital H, capital E. And you'll presently live in a new and wonderful world, no matter what your present circumstances. Yeah, those step nine pr promises are, are really great. But I love the promises on page 100. And I just love, there's this theme in the book 
about God's hand. And I won't go through like all, all the pages, but in, there is a solution. It talks about how as an alcoholic, I, I, I'm been swept away, right, by, by this current. And I'm, I'm in this like torrential river at flow and I'm grasping and trying to grab onto anything and the water's taking me and I'm hitting the rocks and I know that I'm drowning and I'm not going to make it. And I grab a hold of this thing that feels like a flimsy reed. And it feels like it's going to pull out of the riverbed and I'm going to go and be lost forever. But this flimsy reed turns into the loving and powerful hand of God. And then when we were talking about step nine, there was that gentleman who, you know, stole the money from his from the bitter, uh, business rival. And then he lied about it. And he knew he had to make that right. He had to restore his reputation, that man's reputation. But he knew if he if he didn't, take that action. He was scared. He would drink again and all would be lost anyhow. And he said, I saw that I had to put the outcome in God's hand or all would be lost anyhow. And we're going to see when we get to two wives, another, you know, if a repetition is to be avoided, if a relapse is to be avoided, we put, we put it and we leave everything in God's hand. And when I put myself in God's hand, the outcome is better than I could have imagined. And how do I put myself in God's hand? I work these steps like my life depends on it. And it's one of those things. I, maybe you guys have not. But has anyone here also been called a handful? <laughs> anyone here been told you're a handful? Perhaps. Thank you. Perhaps it's because that's whose hands I needed to be. Maybe I was a handful because I needed to be in God's hand. And I love, I love that I will live in a new and wonderful world, no matter what your present circumstances. Again, my, my emotional sobriety, my happiness, my joy, my serenity, my peace is not contingent upon the things that happen outside of me. It has everything to do with that connection with God. So it says, when working with a man and his family, you should take care not to participate in their quarrels you may spoil your chance of being helpful if you do. And that's another theme that we see. My responsibility to the new person, to the new prospect, to the newcomer, to my sponsee, is to be helpful. I'm not their God. I don't always know what's best for them. I don't always know what's right. My responsibility is to be helpful. In fact, it says to be helpful is our only aim. Welcome, we're on page 100. So glad you're here. And, it's, and so it, it says, but urge upon a man's family that he has been a very sick person and should be treated accordingly. And often in, in sort of modern, you know, in, in modern context, we see sick and, and we think bad or wrong or we don't like that. And, or maybe it feels like a cop out. But that when we're dealing with somebody who is alcoholism or addiction or whatever brings you to the study today, what we're talking about is somebody who is operating from a place of pain, operating from a deep sense of separateness from God. And so you should warn against arousing resentment or jealousy. You should point out that his defects of character are not going to disappear overnight. Show them that he has entered upon a period of growth. Of growth. Ask them to, to remember when they are impatient, the blessed fact of his sobriety. And what I love is in some of these later chapters, we see a little bit of nuance where two things can be true at once, where yes, we have dramatic, spectacular, powerful recoveries, deep and profound spiritual experiences. And if you've been coming, you know that I'm big. We don't sell the power of God short. We don't sell the power of these steps short. Man, we like we have powerful spiritual awakenings and and I still have some defects and they still pop up where both those things are true and that we are on a period of growth again it is spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection I might not ever hit that place of perfection spiritually somebody like me it's quite obvious probably not but I am called to grow, to progress, to move towards that ideal. And that's one of the only places where we talk about, you know, an ideal that we're working towards. The other places it's in our, you know, sex ideal, our relationship ideal. 
And so it says, if you have been, um, oh, <laughs> one second. I just have somebody who's asking uh, for the, I'm gonna see if I can send this a person a, a, the poster real quick. <laughs> oh, it's one of those, one of those things. Uh, oh. I was supposed to ask for help with stuff and I always forget to do that. So I just multitask and we can see that that goes quite poorly. As you guys know, who's been coming for a while and you'll just throw something in the chat and I'm like, oh, a tangent, off we go. Uh, so if you, have, bottom of page 100, if you have been successful in solving your own domestic problems, tell the newcomer's family how that was accomplished. In this way, you can set them on the right track without being critical of them. The story of how you and your wife settled your difficulties is worth any amount of criticism. Again, what do I have to share? My experience. I'm not here to tell you what you have to do. I'm here to show you what has worked for me. And the most powerful thing that I can share is my experience. And often, often, right? What do I wanna? I wanna show up to sponsorship and I wanna have all the answers and I wanna know all the things that I, the struggle with that defect of perfectionism. I want to be perfect and do it right. Yeah, I think she was kicked out. Okay, yes, yes, um, let me find you. Paige, where are you? Okay. Uh, you are the host now. Yep, got you. Thank Is you it? so much. Oh, I so appreciate it. That's why I'm the co-host. <laughs> um, yeah. Is, is I don't, I'll try to see if I can get those technical issues sorted, but I'm glad, I'm glad we planned for that. And you know what I love is my internet cut out or just had a weird stall out right as I was talking about that perfectionism. I mean, I will say that is good timing. All right, so, uh, so what we're talking about is uh, that I, I might want to be perfect and show up and be perfect or show up to this big book study and do it perfectly and not have my internet cut out or Zoom kick me out and pop me back on or whatever it is that seems to be happening. But it is my difficulties that make me more useful to others, the struggles that I have and how God has taken me through them. Right. If you remember in the third step prayer, it talks about relieve me of my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help with thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. So it is my difficulties that are, are useful and how God has worked in my life to overcome, help me overcome those difficulties and, and carry me through them. So now one of the things is we're talking about, we trans we transition into a part of the a, part of um, working with others, uh, bottom of page 100, for those that just popped in, uh, we're transitioning into a part of working with others where it talks about how we can go anywhere. But I always want to contextualize where are we in the book? We are in step 12 and talking about actively working with others, sponsoring others spiritually fit. Also, a lot of what we're going to talk about in this chapter comes from the time and the culture of when this book was published. And it's kind of helpful to understand that history to kind of understand what we're talking about in this section of working with others. So when this book was published, the 18th Amendment, I believe it's the 18th Amendment, was just repealed. Um, and that was the amendment that made uh, the ban the sale of alcohol in the United States. So alcohol had been essentially illegal. And then, um, oh, you know what, I just had a yeah, we're good. I just wanted to check the co-host things to make sure just in case my internet popped out again. Uh, just want to be safe rather than sorry. But in that time, so this, the alcohol had been made legal again in the United States. And the topic of alcohol reform was actually an incredibly contentious hot button issue. 
and I'm sure we know nothing about contentious hot button issues that have been talked about in the world over the last few years. Can't relate to that. So keep in mind, that's kind of the world the book was published in. We're talking about alcohol and what to do about alcohol is it's a little touchy. So that kind of contextualizes some of what we're going to read. So it says, assuming we are spiritually fit. Now that's something to start with. I need to start with the place of spiritual fitness. I need to be in that place first. Assuming we're spiritually fit, we can do all sorts of things alcoholics are not supposed to do. People have said, we must not go where liquor is served. We must not have it in our homes. We must shun friends who drink. We must avoid moving pictures which show drinking scenes. We must not go into bars. Our friends must hide their bottles. If we go in, if we go to their houses, we mustn't think or be reminded of alcohol at all. Our experience shows that this is not necessarily so. And again, we're going to see some conditions. It says, we meet these conditions every day. See, my problem is not really the substance. My problem is my spiritual condition. It says an alcoholic who cannot meet them still has an alcoholic mind. When we talk about that alcoholic mind, what we're talking about is the mental obsession. That insane thought that I have when, when my alcohol, when I am as sober as I am today and my alcoholism is untreated. That thought that tells me this time will be different. That thought that tells me nobody will ever know. That thought that I'll go out for three drinks or my problem was booze, but I can smoke crack like a lady. You know what I mean? That insane thought that takes me back to the first drink. And it says there is something the matter with his spiritual status. So if I am experiencing the mental obsession, what that is telling me is my spiritual malady is untreated. And another way to describe that is, is I'm experiencing a sense of separateness from God. And that's what I need to treat. And it says his only chance for sobriety would be, his only chance for sobriety would be someplace like the Greenland ice cap. And even there, and I looked it up, and the uh, people of uh, Greenland would use the term Inuit, which is actually really interesting because that's the same term for the people in Canada. And I did promise some Greenland fun facts uh, to those who saw the announcement. So um, some fun facts about Greenland is, did you know that Greenland is the largest island that is not also a continent? Just, just a fun fact. Also, it's, it's considered a territory of Denmark. And if you've ever seen the flag of Greenland, it's a, this is my opinion, this is not a fact. It's a really good flag. It's, it's a cool flag. Um, so that's just some fun facts about Greenland. But Greenland often does have high rates of alcoholism and very high rates of suicide. So it's, it's kind of ironic. They'd be like this remote far area of the world and somebody would show up with a bottle of scotch and ruin everything. But also there's, there's alcoholism there too. And, and, and the metaphor is that I cannot run from my alcoholism because the problem is within me and everywhere I go, there I am. So it says, ask any woman who has sent her husband to distant places on the theory that he would escape the alcohol problem. In our belief, any scheme of combating alcoholism which proposes to shield the sick man from temptation is doomed to failure. I cannot live my life hiding from, well, trying to hide from substances. I'm sure we've tried that, trying to hide from alcohol, trying to avoid it, but it doesn't work. It's not, it's not a way to live life. It says if an alcoholic tries to shield himself, he may succeed for a time, but he usually winds up with a bigger explosion than ever. We have tried these methods. These attempts to do the impossible have always failed. And what I'll point out, and I, I want to be, I'm not, there's nothing wrong with a place like treatment uh, or a rehab center or sober living. There's nothing wrong with that. But we can ask ourselves, hey, did I ever go to rehab? Did I ever go to treatment? Did I ever go to so sober living and relapse, right? There's nothing wrong with that. And there are times where it can be good to go and, and get like a little bit of time away from, you know, the substance to get our head on straight. But so many of us know that that wasn't a solution. 
and we we drank, we relapsed as soon as we got out. Heck, some of us relapsed when we were in there, right? And so hiding from it is not a solution. What our solution is, is it, and just I'm just saying that for anyone that's joined and new and, and hasn't come to the study, you might not know. Our solution is a spiritual awakening. Our solution is, is an entire psychic change. What that means is a change of our mind and our, of our soul. Getting connected with a power greater than ourselves. And that mental obsession is relieved. That's what we're after. That's our solution. And then with that, we go help others. That's what we got here. And so it says, so our rule. Oh, look, there's rules. In this. <laughs> what a gosh. So our rule is not to avoid a place where there, where there is drinking. If, keep in mind, it is in italics. If it is in italics, the squiggles, the squiggly writing, that means a hundred drunks agreed to spend money on it. They did not have, right? So it's important. Go to your business meeting and ask to spend money and just see how unlikely it is to get people to agree to spend that money. So it says, if we have a legitimate reason for being there. So already we see two conditions. This condition, this first condition is that we're spiritually fit. And how do I get spiritually fit? fit? I work all of these steps. I'm active in step 10, 11, and 12. I'm working with others. I'm spiritually fit. I'm doing this deal. And I have a legitimate reason for going. Do I have good reason for going? It says that includes bars, nightclubs, dances, receptions, weddings, even plain ordinary whoopee parties. Oh, thank goodness. I was so worried that whoopee parties would be off limits. I can go to a whoopee party. And that would just be kind of like a, like a house party or a, like a get together where there was drinking. Um, whoopee, exactly, yeah. And I want you to know when I was drinking, it wasn't a lot of whoopee, it was a lot of consequences is what I got to. They didn't have consequences parties, you know? Although that would happen the morning after, anywho. To a person who has an experience with an alcoholic, this may seem like tempting providence, capital P providence, but it isn't. And what they're talking about is that seems like tempting fate. Like, are, are you are you crazy? Like, you, why would you take an alcoholic out, out anywhere, you know, especially if there's drinking? And it says, you will note that we made an important qualification. Therefore, ask yourself, on each occasion. And that's something that's often missed. I'm not saying that we're black and white people. I'm just, I'm just saying I can tend to be a little all or nothing. And so we often think, man, I can't go to bars or the book says I can go to bars. There's no other condition. I gotta go to, you know what I mean? I can do whatever I want. Don't tell me what to do. You know, like we take it from these extreme to extreme, but there's a lot of subtlety and nuance in the direction. So it says. Therefore, ask yourself on each occasion, before I go each and every single time, ask myself this, have I any good social, business, or personal reason for going? Um, going to this place. So do I have a good reason? And it says, or am I expecting to steal a little vicarious pleasure from the atmosphere of such places. And you'll notice in that question, or in those two questions, what we're getting is the difference of, am I going to give or am I getting going to get? Am I showing up with how can I be of service? Or am I showing up with what about me? And can I get a little bit of, ooh, right? And that's gonna be the, the distinction and the qualification. So it says, if you can answer these questions satisfact satisfactorily, you need have no apprehension, go or stay away, whichever seems best. And one of the things I want to point out is there's no guilt, there's no shame, there's no, it's, yeah, if you are in a good place, you're going for good reasons, spiritually fit, go. And if not, don't go. There's no judgment, no shame, no, nothing like that, whatever seems best. And it gives us a little bit of a warning here, but be sure you are on solid spiritual ground before you start and that your motive in going is thoroughly good and this is one of those places when it talks about like doing an action where it's like hey actually this time check your motives 
much of the time in the book is like, just go do, just go do, take the action, take the action. This is asking me to check my motives and make sure I'm on solid spiritual ground. And this is one of those things that at least for me, I found to be true. My foundation can't just for me, for me, I can be wrong. You can tell me I suck, um, put it in the chat. Uh, <laughs> but uh, for me, my foundation cannot be steps one, two, three. My foundation has to be all 12 steps. Otherwise, I don't got a foundation. I have to have a foundation for life. And that is all 12 steps. And so I need to be on that solid spiritual ground, that foundation, all of them. And it says, do not think of what you will get out of the occasion. Think of what you can bring to it. And that, do not think of what you will get out of the occasion. Think of what you can bring to it. That has been the cure for social anxiety for me. Like truly, truly. I, I'll share this kind of story with you guys. Um, I was at a, a housewarming um, a number of years ago. And uh, I was with like a lot of uh, people, a lot of people in recovery, a lot of people who had done a lot of therapy. Um, I'm, I'm saying that because they could really talk about what was going on for them. And so we're sitting around at the house party and, and there's a couple people, you know, that are drinking, but it's not really like at housewarming. And it was so interesting to watch because as they would kind of go around, there's one person that was like, you know, I, whew, my social anxiety is really bad right now. And the next person was like, man, I, let me tell you about, I hear you. I'm really feeling a lot of that. Yeah, that social, it's kicking in. And there was a lot of people that were just so well articulated with their feelings and what was going on and were able to share how bad their social anxiety was. And I was able to, to see, no one was thinking about anyone else. We were all worried about our own social anxiety. We we're like, oh, what will people think of me? Will they like me? Will they not? What about me? And ev because everybody was worried about it. No one was busy judging or criticizing me. And what I have found is whenever I show up to really any, any area of my life, if I show up with what can I bring to this? How can I give to this? That gives me like, that gives me a goal and a mission. And I'm not sitting in the corner thinking, oh God, do people think I'm a loser? I'm going and finding that person in the corner and trying to make them feel welcome, make them feel comfortable. Who needs my help? Heck yeah, let's bring that joy. Let's bring that power of God. Let's channel God into whatever we're doing. And we can do it anywhere, right? I, I had to go to the registry's office. Uh, that's the DMV for people in America. And I'm not sure what it would be called in the UK. But I had to, I had to go get my, um, my ID renewed. And to show up with that spirit of what can I give? How can I be of service? That changes the DMV. And just kind of a, this is a, a little, you know, um, one of the places where the presence of God in my life has been so clear for me in the last, in the last year or so. Oh, it's the Secretary of State office in Michigan. Um, so if you're wondering, that, that is fancy. It's a fancy name for DMV. Um, go to Michigan and you can go to the Secretary of State. Oh, fancy. Sorry. Uh, it's probably just like a DMV, but tweety tweety. Uh, uh, sorry. That's the thing about getting distracted that I have. Uh, but one of the places where the, the presence of God has been the most clear for me lately has been the airport. The presence of God has been so clear to me in the in the local airport. And it's a, it's, you, I wouldn't have expected, I wouldn't have thought that. And it really has been when I show up with that presence of God, when I show up with that conscious contact and who can I help and how can I help? And that unconditional love, which is not mine because I'm, I'm judgy and insecure, right? I'm on my own power. I'm worried about what these people think of me. When I show up with that, Man, the world opens up and I just see that love and presence is abundant, abundant. And so it gives us a direction. But if you are shaky, if you're not sure about this, if you are shaky, you better work with another alcoholic instead. It's one of those things. It's like one of the most consistent things in this book. 
work with others, work with others, work with others. I mean, so consistent that the chapter is called Working with Others. I got some news. I'm going to have to work with others. Man, it's a real subtle. They slipped it in there, you know, just got bamboozled with that whole working with others thing, right? But it is a consistent suggestion. If I'm hurting, if I'm struggling, if I'm afraid, go help others carry this message. And if I'm, you know, if I'm at the DMV, if I'm, if I'm at the re registries or the secretary of state in Michigan, you know, all of those fancy places, if I can show up with how can I give or a meeting I've never gone to, or, you know, oftentimes so many of us have a fear of public speaking which is not really a fear of public speaking. It's a fear of messing up public speaking and everyone judging me for it. That's, that's what it is. But if I show up to, to speak, to do something like that with, how can I serve? Who can I help? And this is just something that might be helpful while I'm on this little tangent. Uh, there's a pocket prayer that I have, which is God, your words, my mouth. And it's just, it helps me get out of self and because that's what I want. I want to get me out of the way. Let God, with my own understanding, work through me. So why sit with a long face in places where there is drinking, sighing about the good old days? If it is a happy occasion, try to increase the pleasure of those there. Be the joy bringer, right? Bring that joy. Absolutely. If it is a business occasion, go attend to your business enthusiastically. And also, please forgive me if I've explained this a million times. I have a bad habit for over-explaining the etymology of the word enthusiasm. Um, so, I mean, the Greenland fun facts are new. The enthusiasm might be a replay. Um, but enthusiasm is Greek in origin. And it essentially means to be filled with God's spirit. And I love that. Show up enthusiastically. Filled with God's spirit. For business, for whatever, right? If you are with the person who wants to eat in a bar, by all means, go along. Let your friends know that they are not to change their habits on your account. At a proper time and place, explain to all your friends why alcohol disagrees with you. If you do this thoroughly, few people will ask you to drink. And that's, and that's the thing. I can't convince people to ever fully understand but if I do a good job of explaining what happens to me once I start to drink, listen, I know you think it would be fun if I have a drink or two in Cuba, but I also don't think you're prepared for all of us to be in a Cuban like jail cell, like there are consequences that happen with my inability to control. Or yes, yes, I know that you think like, you know, the light beer couldn't hurt me, but I'm sure you're attached to your television and you don't want me to pawn that for drugs. I mean, you can do it more <laughs> with more nuance and subtly, subtlety than I am. <laughs> you can explain that, hey, I have this abnormal reaction to alcohol or substances or whatever brings you here where, you know, once I start, I can't control the amount I take or whatever. And it says, while you were drinking, you were withdrawing from life little by little. Don't, don't, uh, sorry, now you're getting back into the social life of this world. Don't start to withdraw again just because your friends drink liquor. We get to be a part of this world. And we're going to see that as a theme as we get to, again, some of these later chapters that I, I'm, I hope you guys are excited for. I'm excited to get into. We're going to talk about this definitely in the family afterward, but there's also going to be suggestions about being a part of life and two wives. And, and I'm just jazzed how that theme's going to continue on. And it says your job now. So your job now. Now, keep in mind, in step three, I got that pink slip. I got fired. I was fired from the management position of my life. Fired. I am no longer manager. Here's why I managed my life into an unmanageable position. The dumpster of my life was on fire. It was bad. Pink slip. I'm fired. Uh, P45, in the, if you're in the UK, fired, right? And so in step two, I was given a new manager. And in step three, I signed that employment contract. I'm going to work for God. And I'm like, okay, I'm working for God. What is my next assignment? I hope it's a super cool thing. Like, you know, I'm an agent for God. That just means acting on God's behalf. But I mean, I'm going to go agent page, pew, 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 right? Secret agent page. What am I doing for God? 
And then it says our, our next step is a personal house cleaning. Oh, I gotta clean the house, right? So I, I do my spiritual custodial duties in four and five. And I think, man, do I get a promotion? Do I get to do something new? And it's like, well, you get moved to the willingness department. And I'm like, do you mean defect removal? And no, willingness. I don't get to remove the defects. I get to grow in willingness. And then what happens is I'm like, cool. I go out and make some amends. And the reason why is my, it's my real purpose is to fit myself to be of maximum service to God and the people about me. That's my job. And then I get moved in and keep in mind, I don't drop these job responsibilities. I'm just given more and more tasks, but they're, they're incredible. And so the, the next task that I am given, the next task I'm given is to grow in effectiveness and understanding of God's will in step 10. And now here at step 12, I get a new job. And it says, your job now is to be at the place where you may be of maximum helpfulness to others. And I love that it's others. Of course, I'm, I have been created specifically to work with people who have suffered the way that I have suffered, but to be of maximum helpfulness, helpfulness to others, anyone that I may come in contact with, how can I help? And it says, you, um, so never, never hesitate to go anywhere if you can be helpful. If that is my motive. Again, helpful does not mean me playing God, trying to control people and the outcomes but how can I help? You should not hesitate to visit the most sordid spot on earth on such an errand. Keep on the firing life with these motives and God will keep you unharmed. God keeps us unharmed. God keeps me sober. A spiritual awakening is what I need for contented permanent sobriety. God's doing the real work. God's doing the heavy lifting. God's doing the managing. I'm doing the showing up for others, right? And what I want to point out is that firing line. So we are called to be on the firing line of life with these motives. But if we've been through the book, we're, you might think, hey, wait a minute, that firing line, where have I seen that before? Where have I heard that before? What was in the doctor's opinion on page XXVIII? It's when Dr. Silkworth starts getting a little defensive. And he talks about if any feel that as a psychiatrist directing a hospital for alcoholics, we appear somewhat sentimental. Let them stand with us a while on the firing line. And now we are standing on that firing line of life. You know, and one of the things I spoke about in that paragraph about, you know, the firing line in the doctor's opinion, where I was kind of joking, he gets a little defensive. Just that idea is I do not know the, who I will hurt with my alcoholism. Right, I, I spoke about how I, I would have never imagined, never imagined that I would have kept a doctor up at night worried about me. And I remember being at a time in my life where I was homeless and, and on the streets and there was a, a woman who had seen me and she would walk by and she's like, I hadn't seen you in a while and I was worried about you. So I worried a, a complete stranger in my life. And so by that same token, I do not know who my recovery can help. And that is that hope that's on offer. I don't know who I will help by living this way of life. And the reality is it's none of my business. My business is to stand on the, on the firing line of life, properly armed with facts about myself, properly armed with these tools, these, this way of life, the spiritual experience and my own experience to help others. That's what I'm called to do. And it says, many of us keep liquor in our homes. We often need it to carry green recruits through a severe hangover. Keep in mind, they didn't have as much availability and readily availability of detoxes and rehabs and, and places that you could take drugs to. They'd have to detox them themselves. Now, that's not necessarily true in, in this, you know, 2023. We can take them to detox and we should, especially if they're detoxing off alcohol because it, it can be fatal, right? And it says, um, some of us still service to our friends, provided they are not alcoholic. But we think, uh, but some of us think we shouldn't serve liquor to anyone. We never argue this question. Keep in mind, we're kind of pointing to or talking about that, that issue that was 
kind of a real big deal in, in, in the 1930s about whether alcohol should be legal or not and what should we do. So they're trying to like stay out of that controversy. So uh, we never argue this question. We feel each family in the light of their own circumstances ought to decide for themselves. We're not dictating to anyone. We are careful never to show intolerance. Um, we are careful never to show intolerance or hatred of drinking as an institution. And that would be that tone and that uh, that came from that time. Experience shows that such an attitude is not helpful to anyone. Every new alcoholic looks for the spirit among us and is immensely relieved when he finds we are not witch burners. And at least in uh, in the kind of the modern age, we don't really see that too much. Except with nicotine, I will say, you know, I, because I used to, like, it's, it's a beautiful story, but God without question separated me from nicotine. But I would remember being outside of a meeting, having a cigarette, and, and people, former smokers, would be like, oh, oh, it stinks, and oh, that stuff will kill you. And I, not being as spiritually fit, uh, would take a long haul on my cigarette, like just a long drag, and be like, here's hoping, just sarcastic and rude <laughs> um but it, it's a lot of that like is anyone nag nagging does not you know get the you know and when I switched to vaping people I would you know have my delicious fruity nicotine and people would be like hey that stuff's worse than smoking and I'm like who cares you know like it, it I, that doesn't open me up to change being nagged being pressured it, it doesn't work and so that's what it's saying. It's like, hey, it be, it's saying alcohol is awful for you. Alcohol will kill you or whatever. It doesn't help. Heck, we know it doesn't help because that isn't enough to keep us sober. Self-knowledge doesn't fix us. And so it says a spirit of intolerance might repel alcoholics whose lives could have been saved had it not been for such stupidity. And of course, it's talking about intolerance of, of alcohol as an institution. But, you know, it, it just reminds me of page 19, bottom of page 19, where it says most of us sense that a real tolerance of other people's shortcomings and viewpoints and a respect for their opinions and attitudes, which are our attitudes, which make us more useful to others. Again, even in step one, it's calling me to be of use to others. And, and that, it says, our very lives as ex prom drinkers depend upon our constant thought of others and how we might help meet their needs. It sounds like I got to work with others. Oh, man, that's going to be a lot of work. <laughs> All right. So it says we would not even do the cause of temperate drinking. So temperate drinking would be moderate drinking, people who are drinking normally. For not one drinker in a thousand likes to be told anything about alcohol by one who hates it. Someday we hope Alcoholics Anonymous will help the public to a better realization of the gravity of the alcohol problem but we shall be of little use if our attitude is one of bitterness or hostility. Drinkers will not stand for it. That's how I'm called to show up to life, at least for me, free from bitterness and hostility. And we're going to wrap up with, it, with these italics. After all, our problems were of our own making. Rude and accurate. Rude and accurate to call me out like that. Bottles were only a symbol. Besides, we have stopped fighting anybody or anything. We have to. Call back to step 10 when we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. So we'll leave it there. And, and uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for coming. Next week, we'll pick up two wives and I hope to see, see you guys back. Bye.